All right, so what is torrenting? You've probably heard the word before, maybe in the same sentence as movies or big files, but let's slow it down. What does it actually mean? Torrenting is just a way to share files, but instead of getting the whole file from one big server, you get little pieces of it from lots of different people. That's called peer-to-peer -peer sharing, or P2P. Think of it like this. Instead of one bakery giving out all the bread, imagine a whole neighborhood where everyone bakes a loaf and hands it to someone else. You're not relying on one shop everyone's helping each other, and the bread gets around faster. Now, how is that different from regular downloading? When you download from a website, you're pulling the file from a single place, like a vending machine. But with torrenting, you're grabbing pieces from a bunch of people at the same time. This group of people sharing the same file is called a swarm. More people means more pieces being shared, which usually means a faster download. But is it always that smooth? Well, not always, but we'll get to that. So how does your torrent app know what to download, or where to look. That's where torrent files and magnet links come in. A torrent file is like a recipe. It doesn't hold the file itself. It just lists all the ingredients, what parts the file has, how big they are, and which tracker to contact first. A magnet link skips the file and jumps straight to the point. It uses a unique identifier, sometimes called a hash, to help your app find the file pieces from other people right away. It's faster to share, and you don't need to download anything extra to get started. So with all that in mind, why would someone choose torrenting over a regular download? Well, some files are huge, games, movies, full operating systems, and downloading them from one place can be slow or unreliable. Torrenting spreads that load out. Instead of hammering one server with a thousand requests, everyone who downloads helps upload too. It's like sharing the weight so no one gets crushed. That's why a lot of open source projects and public archives use torrents. They don't need giant servers, they just let the community help help pass the files around. That's smart, right? All right, you've seen how torrenting works and why people use it. But let's be real for a second. Can it actually get you into trouble? Here's the real deal. Torrenting is just a way to share files, like using a tool. Think of it like a kitchen knife. It's totally fine if you're using it to make a sandwich, but if someone uses it the wrong way, that's when it becomes a problem. Same thing here. If you're sharing files that are meant to be public, you're good. If not, that's when things get messy. So no, the technology isn't the issue. It's what you're doing with it that counts. If it's open and legal content, no worries. But if it's copyrighted stuff you weren't supposed to grab, that's where things can go sideways. So what kind of stuff can you actually torrent without getting into trouble? It's more than you might think. Linux is a great example. Distros like Ubuntu and Fedora are shared through torrents all the time. It saves bandwidth for the people hosting the files and speeds up the download for everyone else. Open source software is another one. Tools like LibreOffice are built for sharing. Some of their official websites even include torrent links. You've also got public domain material, old books, classic films, or music where the copyright has run out. That stuff's totally fine to share. You've also got Creative Commons stuff. That's media from creators who actually want others to grab it, remix it, or pass it around. They put it out there on purpose so it can spread. So yeah, torrenting isn't shady by default. It just depends on what you're pulling. But what happens if you grab something you probably shouldn't have? First off, copyright. You might be pulling files that legally belong to someone else. Depending on where you live, that could mean anything from a warning to a fine or even legal action. Even if copyright doesn't catch you, your internet provider might. They can see what you're doing online. If they notice sketchy downloads, they might throttle your speed or send you a warning. And even if you're not breaking any laws, fake torrents can still wreck your day. Some are packed with viruses or sneaky software that spies on you or drains your computer's power in the background. Others are just garbage, wrong file names, terrible quality, or nothing like what you thought you were downloading. So, what's the moral of the story? Know your local laws. And even if things seem loose legally, your internet provider might still shut you down. So yeah, use your head, play it safe, and you'll avoid a ton of hassle. All right, by now, you get the idea of what torrenting is and the legal side of things. So how does it actually work in practice? Let's start with how a download even begins. Now, once that file is in motion, who's actually sending you the pieces? A seeder is someone who has the full file and is sharing it. A leecher is still downloading, but also sharing the pieces they already got. The more seeders, the better. If you've got a healthy torrent, meaning more seeders than leechers, your download is usually faster. If nobody's seeding, well, you might be stuck waiting forever. So how do all these people find each other in the first place? That's the job of a tracker. It's a server that helps your torrent client connect with others who are sharing the same file. Trackers don't host the file or send anything themselves. They just match people up. And if the tracker goes offline, that's where something called 
called DHT can kick in, which we'll get to next. DHT is a backup plan that doesn't rely on a central tracker. It's a decentralized system where peers help each other find other peers. Think of it like passing notes in a big room. You don't need a teacher to tell you where to go. You just ask the people near you, and eventually, you find what you need. This keeps torrents alive even when trackers are down, which makes the whole system way more resilient. You've got the basics of torrenting down. Now you just need something to actually grab the files. That's where a torrent app, also called a client, comes in. Think of a torrent client like a delivery buddy. You hand it a note, your torrent file, or magnet link, and it runs off to collect pieces of the file from different people online. Once it has them all, it puts everything together for you. And it doesn't stop there. It shares the parts you already have with others too. That's what keeps things running fast. Everyone pitching in. If you're just getting into torrenting, you'll want something that's clean and easy to use. One of the best options out there is QBitTorrent. It's free, has no ads, a simple layout, and even comes with a built-in search bar to help you find torrents faster. Deluge works well if you like to customize. It lets you add plugins and tailor things to your liking. Transmission is great if you're on Mac or Linux. It's quiet, fast, and doesn't get in your way. Not all clients are worth your time. Older versions of uTorrent were known for slipping in adware, and even crypto miners in some cases. Then there's BitTorrent's own app that might look official, but it's packed with ads and doesn't offer much in return. Stick with the open source ones if you want a clean, hassle-free experience. So what should you look for in a torrent app? Honestly, most torrent apps these days can handle the basics. Magnet links, DHT, download limits, all that. What really matters is how clean and reliable the app is. You want something that doesn't throw ads in your face, doesn't sneak in junk during install, and just works without needing a setup guide. And of course, make sure it's still being updated and has a good reputation. If it's fast, reliable, and doesn't try anything sneaky, you're good to go. Right, let's talk about staying safe when you're torrenting. Even if you're not doing anything wrong, it's still smart to protect yourself. When you download a torrent, your IP address, the number that shows who and where you are online, is visible to everyone sharing that file. That includes your internet provider, companies watching for piracy, or just random people. You can actually see it for yourself. There's a site called iknowwhatyoudownload.com. It tracks what people have downloaded based on their IP address, even if you never gave it permission. If you check your own IP there, you might see a list of downloads you don't even recognize. That's because if you're using a shared IP, like in many home setups or VPN services, it can show activity from other people too, not just you. Still, it's a good reminder that your real IP out in the open is risky if you care about privacy. That's why people often use a VPN. It hides your IP, so it looks like the download is coming from somewhere else. Think of it like putting on a mask so nobody knows it's you. And no, this isn't the part where I pitch you a VPN with a 30% off code. So why bother using one? A VPN keeps your activity private. It also helps stop your internet from getting slowed down if your provider doesn't like torrenting. Some even protect you from getting legal warnings. When picking a VPN, go for one that doesn't keep logs, lets you use torrents, and has a kill switch. That's a safety feature that stops everything if the VPN suddenly turns off. Something like Molvad is a good pick. It's privacy focused, doesn't ask for personal info, and just works without bloat. Now even if you're using a VPN and sticking to torrents, there's another risk. Fake files. You might think you're downloading a new movie or game, but instead you get a virus, spyware, or something that secretly drains your computer's power, like a crypto miner. So how do you stay safe? First, don't just click on anything. Check where it came from. Read the comments. See if people are saying it's legit. Start with the file size. If it says it's a full movie but the file is tiny, like 20 megabytes, that's a problem. Watch out for strange names like setup.exe or just file.rar. And if nobody's commenting on it or there are barely any people sharing it, skip it. Stick with names or websites you've heard of before. It's not a guarantee, but it's way safer than guessing. So where do you actually go to get torrents? Let's start with the easy stuff. Public trackers are open to anyone. You don't need an account or an invite. Just head to the site, search, and start downloading. They're great for finding legal stuff, like open source programs, old movies no one owns anymore, or music that artists gave out for free. If you're looking for legal stuff or open source content, there are a few solid sites worth checking out. Public Domain Torrents has tons of classic films you can grab legally. Linux Tracker is the place for getting Linux operating systems. And the Internet Archive? That one's packed with books, music, and videos. And yeah, a lot of it's available through torrents. If you're looking for faster downloads and cleaner files, private trackers are a solid option. These aren't open to just 
just anyone. You usually need someone to invite you, or in some cases, you can apply. But once you're in, the difference shows. Downloads are quicker, files are better organized, and you won't have to deal with as much junk. They do have rules, and some might be strict, but that's kind of the point. It keeps the bad stuff out. Quick warning, don't just type the name of a movie and add the word torrent into Google. A lot of those search results lead to sketchy websites. You might see fake download buttons, weird pop-ups, or worse, something that installs a virus on your computer. So what's the safer move? Stick with sites you know. Look for recommendations in forums or groups where people share safe links, and if you find someone who uploads solid stuff, keep following them. Sure, it might take a bit more time, but it keeps you out of trouble and away from shady sites. Alright, so you downloaded something. Now what? Let's go over the types of files you might see and how to handle them. When the download's done, you'll probably see a few different files in there. If it's a movie or a show, it's usually in .mkv or .mp4 file. Those are the standard video types. For music, you'll probably get .mp3, which is smaller, or .flac if it's high quality. Sometimes the same torrent gives you both. Then there are archive files, things like .rare, .zip, or .7z. These either bundle stuff together or split big files into smaller pieces. You might also see an .iso file. That's like a digital copy of a disk, used for installing games, programs, or operating systems. And don't ignore the little .nfo or .txt file that shows up. It's usually a note from the uploader. Sometimes it has useful info. Sometimes it's just a thank you or a shout out. If your download came in parts, like file.part1.rar, part2, part3, and so on, that's fine. You only need to open the first part. Use something like 7-zip or WinRAR, and it'll put the pieces back together. Just make sure they're all in the same folder. But here's the catch. If you're missing one part or one of them is broken, the whole thing might not open. So double check that you have all the files before you start. Once everything's unpacked, how do you actually play the file? For almost anything, VLC is the go-to. It plays nearly every video or music format, even ones that are a bit broken or weird. If you want something lighter and snappier, MPV is another great option. It doesn't have a fancy interface, but it just works. And stay away from sketchy players or codec packs that promise to fix all your problems. They usually just slow down your computer or install junk. And if your movie's missing subtitles, no big deal. Head over to opensubtitles.org, search the title, and grab the one that matches. Done. And hey, if you're already using or planning to use Qbiterant and want to speed things up, check out my other video where I walk through the best settings. If this helped you out, give it a like, maybe hit subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next one.